Julian, and uh, we have had an absolutely fascinating series of presentations and discussions on issues that many of us uh, have uh, very uh, mixed feelings about and are trying to work through the issue. So we've heard different perspectives. Today we're going to hear about uh, 19th century cholera epidemics and belief in knowledge during novel challenges. The speaker is uh, Professor Pamela Gilbert, Kay Gilbert, and she is the Albert Brick Professor of English at the University of Florida. She's published widely in the areas of Victorian literature, cultural studies, and the history of medicine. Her books include Victorian Skin, 2019, Cholera and the Nation, 2008, The Citizen's Body, 2007, Mapping the Victorian Social Body in 2004, and Disease, Desire, and the Body in Victorian Women's Popular Novels in 1997. So Professor Gilbert, take it away. Well, thank you very much. Let me um, let me just set this up for a second and share my screen. Um, where is the share screen? Here it is. Share screen. Uh, and screen one. Okay. Perfect. There we go. All right. So um, I thought it would be interesting today, given everything that's happened in the last few years, uh, to talk a little bit about um, the cholera epidemics of the 19th century. Um, and I won't explicitly draw the, the comparisons. I'll leave that to you because I think there, there are some interesting ones and of course some interesting differences. So in the 19th century, cholera pandemics occurred around the world. And the disease appeared for the first time in Europe and the Americas. It was a novel challenge, therefore, to existing knowledge and beliefs. And those bring a lot of different narratives into focus as people try to make sense of what's happening by drawing from multiple perspectives. And if the perspectives I'm really gonna talk about today were sort of medical, religious, and of course, political. So, between 1832 and 1866, there were four cholera pandemics hit the UK, hit England, as part of global pandemics, which were even more frequent. There, was, there were um, a couple earlier than 1832, but they didn't cross the channel. Um, and after 1866, after Britain had kind of gotten its act together, they also didn't really cross the channel in epidemic force. So the 1832 was the first one to enter Britain and also the first one to go to the Americas. And it wreaked panic as well as high death rates everywhere it struck. And it's important to notice that actually the death rates were a lot less high than a lot of endemic diseases or epidemic diseases that people have been living with for a long time. But because it was new, people reacted to it much more strongly than they did to the annual breakouts of typhus and typhoid and all of the other lovely things that were part of the 19th century. Um, so the, the 1848 second epi epidemic, uh, sorry, that should read 48 to 49, was uh, global and it caused very high death rates in Britain. 1854, uh, Britain is a little bit more ready, but there's also sort of like spots of high mortality. And then the last and least was 1866. It still caused significant mortality. So out of these four dates, two are, I think, the most interesting for us today because both of these are important in terms of the way that people um, change their points of view or try to absorb new knowledge. So what was cholera? Well, we now understand cholera to be a waterborne disease. It's caused by a comma shaped bacillus uh, called Vibrio cholerae, which is transmitted between humans via the fecal oral route. In other words, you know, feces contaminates, let's say water or food, people ingest that, and then they develop the disease. 
So it's easily treatable today in developed areas. All you need is a ton of clean water and good medical care. But as we know, that's, that's actually a lot uh, and not everyone has that. So cholera remains an important epidemic disease in parts of Africa, India, Latin America. It's taken thousands of lives in Haiti since the earthquake. It's a problem right now in Bangladesh and Pakistan and Cameroon. So it's out there um, and untreated, it can kill pretty quickly through rapid dehydration. It's basically a diarrheal disease. Um, you get copious, uncontrollable diarrhea and it starts to kind of suck all the water out of your body. Um, and as it progresses, the evacuations are clear. They're called like rice water. Um, and so they're hard to see. So they kind of get everywhere, especially if you're in a, in a situation where you can't, um, you know, where you can't maintain a lot of cleanliness. So people in the 1830s, understandably, had no idea what caused this disease and caregivers didn't even know to wash their hands. So uh, you can imagine in an era that didn't even have running water in most homes, this was really a disaster once it got loose. Um, and with many people living in small spaces because of industrialization, it was really easy for contamination to spread. And people were disposing, you don't have sewers in this period in 1832 in London or in any of the major um, cities in, uh, in the UK. And so what people are doing is they're taking their night soil and they're dumping it into the street or into a cesspit. And from there, it's running down the street into the rivers. It's going into you know, cesspits, which are near wells in porous soil. And so it's re-entering the water supply. Um, and so you can see how this is, uh, how this is creating a real condition for spread. So, and the doctors had, of course, also no idea what to do about it. They weren't sure what kind of disease it was. So some of them thought, well, you know, it's a, it's a fever. So we should, you know, treat it like a fever. And other people said, no, the skin is cold. So, um, we have to treat it by, by burning the skin and, and other people said, well, you know, you're losing vital force. So you should bleed people so that it, you know, so that, so that their forces will rally in, in response. Um, none of these things worked. <laughs> About the only thing that did any good and at least eased people's uh, suffering was opium, which people did use. Um, but as you can see, there's not, there's not a lot of, you know, uh, of ways of, of, of treating this disease in 1832. And the theories of what caused the disease ranged from bad weather, foul smells, electromagnetism, and divine vengeance. Like that was the range. So you don't have a germ theory of disease at this point. And I'll talk more about that later. So this image shows uh, a Venetian woman, age 23, uh, before and after contracting cholera. And you'll notice that she is kind of blue. And that's because um, once you deprive the body of enough moisture, you also have trouble getting oxygen to the surface in the extremity. So she is cyanotic with oxygen deprivation. So because dehydration was so rapid, apparently healthy people could get weak very, very quickly. Their appearance was frightening, right? Their skin shriveled, eye sockets collapsed, they were blue, they would scream and thrash uncontrollably as their muscles spasm, and then they were exhausted. And many soon died uh, very often if they already were weakened within the first 24 hours. Um, and most of, of, of patients who reached the stage of collapse, that is being exhausted and not able to move, 50% uh, died within 72 hours. So this was a really scary, scary disease. Um, a rigorous quarantine might have saved Britain. It's an island. Uh, from the dramatic mortality seen on the continent. And it was sort of initially tried in 1831. They tried to impose it on ships coming from the Baltic, but Britain was the mercantile and shipping center of pretty much the Western world at this point. Um, and the merchants were outraged. This is a threat to trade. They didn't believe quarantine would work. They were pretty sure the disease was airborne, that it was from miasma. And so they didn't really enforce the quarantine. And they said, well, look, you know, quarantine has failed in Eastern Europe, but of course, Eastern Europe has huge porous land boundaries. So it's not really analogous to Britain. But in any case, quarantine was tried and rapidly abandoned. The other thing that's happening in this period is that people, a lot of people just didn't believe it. They thought cholera was probably a figment of the imagination. Maybe it was really exaggerated. 
human beings are really not good at believing in things we've never seen or heard of before, um, you know, or have only heard of from a distance. Um, despite the sporadically enforced quarantine, cholera entered Britain in the port town of Sunderland in the fall of 1831. The first patient of record was William Sprout, uh, who was a ship worker, a dock work, dockyard worker, and he died within three days of calling in the doctor. From there, it quickly spread. We have 215 documented deaths, so there were probably many more from, you know, diarrhea, uh, which, you know, encompassed a whole range of possible diseases in an era without refrigeration. Um, so there were many, many thousands more that died in the kingdom um, before it finally, you know, calmed down again in late summer. So when cholera was first discussed by the British public, as it marched across the continent in 1831 and 1832, and people started to get letters from France and, you know, and hear news from Poland that, hey, there's this thing, it's coming, it's coming. Britons were already preoccupied with a big polarizing political topic, parliamentary and voting reform. And uh, this was voting reform to extend the vote uh, from landed, to put it simply, from people who owned land to people who were middle class and might rent in the city, but, um, you know, had felt that they had a stake in the nation, that, that they should be represented. This is well before the one person, one vote, or even one man, one vote. Um, so you had people who were sort of separating into classes in a new way, right? There had always been orders of society, the nobility, the sort of big mass of people in the middle, and then the working class, and then the impoverished and the agricultural classes. Here you start seeing people kind of aligning in a different way around this political topic. And so you have some workers who feel aligned with shopkeepers for the first time, and you have shopkeepers sort of against the landowners. Um, so there's a lot of discussion and it was fairly dramatic. Um, and it had been pretty hotly debated since 1830. So this had been kind of going on since King George IV died. And then it was passed in commons and then it was defeated in the House of Lords in 1831. And there was rioting. And everybody sort of remembered the French Revolution and everybody thought, this could, this could really become a bad thing. So a revised bill was brought forward. So throughout the spring of 1832, the House of Lords is dithering, they're debating, it's getting a lot of press, it's getting a lot of discussion, there are demonstrations, and people are really scared that there's going to be more violence. So interestingly enough, um, you have a lot of people who start talking about cholera in terms of reform, right? Uh, you had middle class people who hoped, and working people who hoped that reform would bring them representation in parliament. And they think that maybe the talk of cholera is being used to distract them from their political goals. Um, you know, the elite wants to retain control of political power. Many people, especially the poor, were not sure that cholera was real. You know, and they weren't reading the newspapers, many were illiterate. Maybe it was just invented to let the powerful take the poor's belongings or even take their bodies. And this was something that uh, had gotten a lot of press a little bit earlier. There was something called the dead body bill that was passed because as medicine developed, they needed more, um, more bodies for dissection and they weren't getting them. And so um, the way that they were getting them was to buy them from people who sold them and not ask very many questions about where those people got them. And in Edinburgh, um, two people, Burke and Hare, decided to bypass the supply chain issue and provide the bodies by murdering people and selling them to the medical school. So um, there was a lot of drama, as you can imagine, around that trial, around the execution of uh, Burke, Hare escaped. Um, and so because of that, the, the government passed a dead body bill. And what that meant was if you died in a pauper institution, if you died penniless, the state would seize your body and hand it over to the medical schools. And the idea was that this would get around the problem of people stealing bodies out of graveyards. But of course, this also meant that if you were sick during a cholera epidemic and hospitalized and helpless, 
and your family couldn't get the money together to bury your body right away, it could be seized and taken. And so there were riots around, around this issue. Um, so violence in, against doctors and government officials was not as prevalent as it was on the continent. Um, and there wasn't quite as much anti-Semitic blaming uh, as there was on the continent. But still, there was some rioting, there was some vandalism, and property owners who were compelled to spend money to clean up nuisances on their property, like cesspits or other, other things that cause bad smells, which people thought might be causing the disease, um, they were also suspicious of the motives of government. Um, so the first epidemic was immediately understood in this context of class and political struggle. So the traditional source of local authority at times like these was the Church of England, which is a state church um, and which uh, administered local boards. I mean, they were really part of the local government. Um, however, it was also under stress from a reform movement. Um, and this was related to voting reform, but not identical with it. This was a movement to grant uh, dissenting Protestants and Catholics more representation in Parliament. Um, and Catholics especially were largely excluded, which is a problem if part of your kingdom is, um, is Southern Ireland. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of pushing back and forth about this, and, and the Church of England really pushed back against giving this kind of, um, of representation to the Catholics. So um, there's also a kind of class hostility to these disputes because Church of England members tended to be wealthier, they tended to be landowning, they tended to be from Southern England, or they tended to come from those areas uh, and be dependent upon landowners. Where power was historically seated, uh, lower middle class industrial and manufacturing districts to the North and West traditionally included more dissenters. And during industrialization, those dissenters had become middle class and gotten some power. And so we're pushing back against the establishment. And then finally, Catholicism was associated with the Irish, both those in Ireland, which were perceived as one kind of problem, um, but also increasingly the Irish were coming to Britain. And in the 1840s, because of the potato famine, there would be a huge influx of desperate, starving, unskilled Irish labor, uh, undercutting the labor market in, in England. And so huge blowback against that immigrant, immigrant population immigrating from another part of the kingdom. So not truly immigrants, but coming from a very different ethnic and linguistic group. So the same class hostility that was linked to political reform got connected to religious conflict, and this kind of undermined the authority of the established church to speak for the larger community in this crisis. Some suggested that God was angry that British Catholics were being accorded more political recognition. And I should point out that in France, people blamed the cholera epidemics on the, um, the loss of standing of the Catholic church <laughs> within the community. So it wasn't a lot of coherence, but it didn't matter because people were concerned with their own narratives in their own community. Political pro-reformers, uh, sometimes mockingly and sometimes in earnest, uh, observed that if God was angry, maybe it's because reform was being stalled. Um, radical press and labor organizations emphasized the absurdity of the solutions proposed by the upper class for an audience in very different circumstances. When the Church of England, backed by Parliament, declared a day of fasting and prayer to ward off the cholera, some labor organizations suggested that we should have a feast day because the poor have already fasted enough. So for example, Henry Hetherington of the Poor Man's Guardian, who himself died of cholera in 1849, ridiculed the notion of the general fast day through several issues um, of the newspaper. Beginning in February of 1832, he says, a general fast is all very fair, for God knows that as yet the fasting has been partial enough. If not merely fasting, but the most abject want be any propitiation for the evil, Never would cholera morbus have made its appearance among us. So these kinds of gestures dramatize the opposing physical circumstances in which rich and poor lived. Ballads that were printed on single sheets and given away or sold for pennies on the street promoted the views of reformers. One example uh, warns, they tell such tales our hearts to fear of cholera raging there and here. The bread pudding and good cheer will drive the cholera morbus. 
reformers will not be deceived, for by them it is all agreed that one and all we shall be freed in spite of the cholera morbus. morbus sorry. So meanwhile, by both the poor and middle classes, the doctors and clergy might be seen as allies of the elite. In one small town, for example, uh, over the Board of Health uh, postings about cholera, uh, notices saying, no cholera at Ellie, the Parsons liars and doctors pickpockets were pasted over cholera warning handbills distributed by the Board of Health. So the middle classes were skeptical on the cholera threat and more concerned with gaining political representation and avoiding disruptions to trade. And the poor feared that this was um, at worst a kind of conspiracy against them to seize their bodies and to seize their assets. You can see here a sort of uh, a typical mocking kind of poster. You can see that the cholera uh, comes in the door and it actually looks like kind of a, a scarecrow. And, and here you have John Bull eating heartily and uh, the young man kicking cholera out the door. So this was one sort of mocking response. Um, the, um, the boards of health would put up notices like this one saying, you know, be temperate in eating and drinking, um, abstain from cold water, and above all, from ardent spirits. Um, so there was a lot of uh, discussion that, you know, because so many poor people were dying, it was kind of assumed that, well, the poor are improvident, they're drunken, they're dirty, and that must be the problem. So it must really be about drunkenness. Um, the 1832 discussion between clergy, sanitarians, and radicals laid the foundation for epidemic disease, and especially cholera, to be central to discussions of state responsibility, poverty, and individual rights and freedoms. Edwin Chadwick, who'd worked extensively with the revision of the poor laws in 1834, was the first person, I'm sorry, was the person who att first attempted in the 40s to proactively deal with sanitary reform at the parliamentary level. Chadwick wasn't a doctor, um, but he was an experienced kind of bureaucrat. And it really didn't occur to anyone in a public health emergency that they should talk to doctors, um, which is interesting, right? Because I think now we would immediately think, well, gosh, it's a disease. Maybe we should talk to someone in medicine. But the assumption was that since this was being caused by kind, some kind of environmental issue or structural issue by nuisances that smelled bad, that maybe really this was more of an engineering issue. So the people who were sent out to do sanitary inspections were tended either to be completely untrained or they had some background in building. And they would go into a neighborhood and inspect by trying to smell bad smells. And you see a little bit of that in this, um, in this uh, illustration here. <laughs> So Chadwick was um, in some ways, you know, a, a very um, abrasive personality uh, and people didn't like him much, but he actually got a public health movement started that eventually was taken over by actual doctors and, um, and, and created the foundation of public health in the British state. So poor went out for Chadwick. <laughs> So filthy nuisances, and they were called nuisances, such as garbage piles or cesspits, smelled bad. And the assumption was it was those bad smells that caused disease. Poor people in slums were much more likely to live next to such unpleasant things because they didn't have much of a choice than wealthier people. Um, made wealthier people think that, well, poor people must like bad smells. Uh, they must choose to be dirty. Um, it must be their habits that are creating um, these, uh, these bad smells. Um, so they were not inclined to try to fix things that they thought were someone else's fault and very likely an expression of divine justice into the bargain, and particularly if they had to pay for it. So at first, it did seem logical to focus on cleanliness, um, which was considered an engineering and moral problem rather than bringing in expertise. And you might just notice in this illustration, a court for King Cholera, that um, some of these uh, 
some of these figures have the characteristic stovepipe hat and sort of jutting jaw that is used to indicate um, Irish ethnicity in the period. Um, so not only is it that it's a lodging house, that it's overcrowded, that the children are playing in the dirt, that this woman is picking, is trying to pick up some food out of the dirt, but it's also that, you know, this is where, this is where it's an Irish slum specifically. So, um, in addition to coding the images as Irish, you often have a, a kind of um, coding of the cholera as foreign. It's either Turkish because that was where the plague was thought to have come from, or they will code it as Indian because it was beginning to be understood that, um, that this had first sort of gotten its start in British India. So here's John Bull catching the cholera, and you'll notice that the cholera looks like looks vaguely like he might be um, Indian. And here you have more sort of a Turkish uh, version of cholera sailing into Britain um, on, the, on the Thames. Um, so let's switch to the second epidemic now. By the second epidemic in 1848, doctors had begun to assert themselves in public policy through these boards of health that Chadwick had originally founded. And still no one knew what caused cholera, but it seemed obvious that epidemic diseases were related. They tended to strike the same areas repeatedly. And I should add that statistical science is just beginning to be invented. They're just beginning to collect data about how people are dying, what they're dying of, where they're dying. So suddenly you have all of this information that, um, that people are starting to draw conclusions from. Um, you had uh, a proposal of another national day of prayer, and this time parliament didn't approve it. Medics began to push back against the authority of clergy, arguing that prevention is more effective than prayer. And in any case, victim blaming with talk of divine vengeance was really counterproductive. And a lot of enlightened clergy backed them up. Further, while cleaning up was still important, doctors argued that a specifically medical response should be involved in the planning and inspecting. So that you know, medical examiners with medical training should be going to these areas and asking people about their habits in, additional, in addition to just smelling for bad smells. So in 1849, uh, John Snow had first argued that water polluted with fecal matter was the cause of cholera. But he was working with an outbreak in Wandsworth, which was at that time a, I mean, now it's kind of a Tony Western uh, part of London, but at that time it was kind of a suburb. It was poor, nobody cared about Wandsworth. And so he was completely ignored. In 1854, and some of you will know this because it's a famous story, Snow was more dramatically able to illustrate his theory tracing an extensive eruption in the St. James area to a single water pump in Soho on Broad Street that drew from a well adjacent to a leaking cesspit. So why did this theory gain traction when it really didn't gain traction in Wandsworth? Well, this was in St. James. Broad Street was in St. James's Westminster, which was a wealthy area. I mean, the St. James Palace is there, there's lots of theaters. It was an area where there were a lot of uh, people who were very well off. There were also some really overcrowded slummish housing where service workers for this area lived, but that wasn't the association that people had with the area. The association was like, that's where the queen goes. That's, you know, that's this really nice area. You so- got a couple of messages in. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, the expensive location really raised alarm. Uh, and various theories started to emerge to normalize the outbreak to say, well, this is an outlier. This isn't really, maybe it's not even really cholera. Um, there was a theory because they were putting sewers in because of former outbreaks through the area that maybe the sewers had disturbed an ancient plague pit. Uh, that was understood to be in this area, and that maybe what was really happening is that the plague was getting loose again. And so that theory actually gained some traction for a while. And um, so a guy named Edmund Cooper made a map to show people <laughs> where the actual plague pit was, and that's what you're looking at. And these black things, the little black boxes on there are like, uh, are the deaths, and then the big shading is the rumored area of the plague pit, 
And then the actual area of the plague pit is the circle. So he shows that in fact, no, it's not the disruption of the plague pit that, um, that has created this, this uh, outbreak. So Snow presumably saw this map <laughs> and uh, discovered and, and you know, had a theory already. He had a theory that it was waterborne. And so he went looking on this map for, well, where are the water sources? And he finds a relationship to the Broad Street Pump. And so he remakes the map very famously to make his argument. And in the history of data visualizations, this is a very new technology. Um, you're looking at probably one of the first spot maps of disease right now. Uh, and I'll show you Snow's map. Um, and the reason that people hadn't done this sort of thing before or hadn't done it very often is that maps were really, really expensive. So you weren't going to take your very expensive map if you were lucky enough to own one and draw all over it. But now in the middle of the 19th century, you have new techniques of printing and imaging and it becomes cheap and anyone can get a map and they're not expensive. And so people start to do things like plot data points on their maps. And this enables th people to think about disease in an entirely different way. And so this becomes, this gets a lot of attention. You know, people start to pay attention to Snow's theory and start to talk about it. And um, a local clergyman who was initially skeptical of Snow did the shoe leather work. That is, he walked with Snow from house to house and asked people, where do you get your water? When did you get sick? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Getting all of that kind of you know, um, deeply textured data about how people live their lives, which is really necessary to, to prove a theory like this, um, because there were outliers, right? There were people who lived closer to another water pump and then revealed that they liked this water pump, that the water tasted better, and that's why they went to that water pump. Um, and then there were people who were close to the water pump who didn't get sick. And, you know, it turned out, well, we work in a brewery and we use the water from the brewery. <laughs> so all kinds of, you know, uh, devils in the details, basically, to make this argument. So this is a key moment in medical history. Um, it's always taught as a key moment in medical history. And it is. It's really important. It's when Snow found the right medium to make his argument and consolidated his information. And this was eventually proven to be true. However, uh, it was many years before anyone accepted this theory. And Snow died in 1858. He never saw it accepted. By that time, London had begun to clean up its water supply and the publicity brought by Snow's study had likely contributed to public pressure on the government to do it. But there was not a moment where Snow said, look, this is obviously what's happening. And everybody said, oh yeah, obviously we should fix this. That is not what happened. Um, so let's sum up a little bit what the period accomplished. Medicine is rapidly developing as a profession. Uh, new scientific breakthroughs are changing the practice of medicine dramatically. The profession is beginning to police itself. It's insisting on more formal sort of certification and training. The beginning of this period, if you wanted to be a surgeon, you apprentice to someone and then you hung out a shingle, right? So, so this is a period where you suddenly have licensing and maybe you should go to medical school and so on and so forth. Um, what would come to be understood over the course of the period as public health was just beginning to emerge in the 1840s, but it would come to play a really central role in the state's relationship to the citizenry. And this centrality was in part made possible by the increase in epidemic diseases related to urbanization, et cetera. But cholera gave medics a really significant opportunity to take center stage through the boards of health. Because of the effects of the 1848 Public Health Act and the subsequent development of central coordination of mortality information, we have a lot more information about what followed than we do in 1832. And there are pretty devastating um, they're pretty devastating statistics. And these statistics are probably very partial. For example, 1848 to 1849, the English government, this is not Scotland, by the way, just England and forget Ireland, over 55,000 deaths had occurred from cholera in England alone, and another 30,000 from diarrhea. Um, by 1848, you have a lot of political unrest in continental Europe. You have a lot of revolutions actually. Um, Britain had had a really economically difficult decade. There was the potato famine. 
Working classes who didn't get increased representation under the 1832 bill were agitating. So the middle classes now, you know, who had been more enfranchised, uh, started to think, you know, gosh, cholera seems to always come with some kind of political threat and revolution. And so the middle class is really aligned with the boards of health. Like we have to put this thing down. This is a problem. This has to stop. So they, in other words, they were more apt to see the government as on their side, um, whereas the poor remained pretty sure the government was not on their side. <laughs> Um, so still, when middle class people were asked to clean up nuisances and pay a lot of money for that, they didn't, they didn't much like it. So you have the progress of sanitary reform kind of lurching slowly. People get scared, there's another cholera epidemic coming, people clean up everything really fast, and then they start to resist doing it once the threat passes. So meanwhile, the medical profession begins to see its role in government as protecting the populace, but also as disciplining and educating the poor and working classes because everyone thought, well, they just don't understand what they need to do for their own good. Again, many sanitary reformers thought that people chose to be dirty and only very slowly came to understand how difficult it might be to choose to be clean without running water or adequate food or adequate housing. Government began to move toward a more proactive and interventionist model of public health care which would encompass not only the prevention of epidemics, but day-to-day -day issues of hygiene and education. And meanwhile, a big project to expand and modernize the sewers was marching forward, uh, spurred in part by cholera. And you see that at the moment when people think that maybe the St. James epidemic is being touched off by the sewerage work disturbing the plague pits. So 1854 wasn't as severe, as I said, as 1848. And Britain started to see gains that they could link to these improved sanitary measures. And then 1866 was mild by comparison because of that. Voting reform, there continued to be reform bills throughout the century, but like the big explosive game changer was 1832. And so these were, these were not as threatening. Um, so, so. We've seen that in 1832, people resisted new knowledge about the cholera epidemic because it challenged their economic interests, their political suspicions, and their understanding of how epidemics worked. Economics and political resistance were still operative in 1850s, in the 1850s, but, how, but much less so. So why didn't people adopt Snow's theory? Well, um, cognitive psychologists believe that we use schemas mental framework stored in memory, containing basic knowledge about the concepts we know to guide perception and problem solving. So that when we get new knowledge, and this is Piaget, you know, um, going, back, going back to the mid 20th century, we try to fit that new knowledge into our existing schemas. And new information therefore is assimilated. And sometimes assimilated means it's modified to fit uh, the existing schema. When it's too different, we have to accommodate, right? We have to change our schema. And boy, we do not like that. <laughs> um, and that resistance to changing our schema comes into play most strongly when issues are emotionally charged, when they're linked to deeply held beliefs and identities. Um, emotions run high when there's a perception of danger, when there is a perception of uh, danger to a group identity, so political polarization, which is linked to not only a sense of identity, but values, often coded as moral or religious values, divine values. So part of the problem that led to the delayed acceptance of Snow's theory, despite its overwhelming evidence, is that it really didn't fit these existing schemas about how epidemics works, worked. And these have been in place since Hippocrates. I mean, doctors still quoted Hippocrates, <laughs> ancient Greece, to explain epidemics. They were associated with bad air, miasma, and in the sanitary area, era, era, sorry, bad smells, right? And there were some strengths of this theory, right? Bad smells often meant sewage and other pollution that did indeed cause disease. So people could see like there was a bad smell and then people got sick. Low stagnant water that smelled bad often also meant mosquitoes and malaria, although people didn't know about mosquitoes role in malaria. Um, overcrowding, poverty, uh, slums tended to be closer to the water and, um, and you know, often those were overrun by lice and lice carried typhus. So there were regular outbreaks of typhus that tended to be 
nearer low areas. In low-lying and polluted London, there were often clouds of smoke and discolored mists. So people would think that they had seen the miasma. Oops, sorry. Oh, I seem to have lost my slides. So here's an example, which uh, when I originally found this map, uh, I thought that someone had spilled ink on it at first. And then I realized no, because the Thames is uh, exempted from the, from the staining. And someone had actually pretty carefully gone through and tried to stain differentially the areas that were most heavily cholera infested to show the blue cloud that some people um, believe that they had seen um, during the cholera epidemics. Uh, and I'll give you, here's a, here's a map of one parish showing the cholera mist. And you can see that it's sort of, the sort of sepia tone is darker uh, at the side of the screen to your left, as you're facing it, your left. Um, and this was also an attempt to render some image of the cholera mist. And if you think back to Snow's um, map, you can see that these people are also using maps to advance their theories of disease. Um, but if you looked at this map, right, you might think, oh, okay, so the miasma is linked to these uh, areas where there are a lot of deaths. You wouldn't necessarily think, oh, look, it's the Broad Street pump, right? So the um, maps and data visualizations could be used just as often to argue a, a wrong theory as a right theory. And I think we have a tendency to think about these data visualizations being used to understand the truth as a tool, when at this period, at least, they were still being used very much uh, to make an argument um, that, was, that was already the argument that the person believed. Um, so moving from an air transmission model to a fecal oral waterborne model required a huge cognitive shift. It triggered disgust that rich and poor were connected by the same water source and were ingesting each other's waste. Uh, the moral blaming of the poor, which had a self-protected element. I mean, think of all the people who today uh, react when they hear someone has lung cancer by kind of immediately saying, well, I quit smoking <laughs> or I never smoked, right? This is a kind of irrational response that we see a misfortune and we want to think that won't happen to me. Um, and that was very much in place for the wealthier classes. They said, this is a poverty disease. It's not a danger to me, even though, of course, many, many um, well-off people did, in fact, die of the disease. So I'm virtuous, I'm clean, I'm middle class, I'm safe. That's very hard to root out. And it was deeply embedded in Protestant ideas about monetary and class status as divinely appointed and as personally earned. Finally, the fear of a novel disease agent and heightened anxiety around political structures made people not want to give up their existing beliefs. People defend their existing beliefs tenaciously when there is heightened anxiety. So the clergy had handed over a lot of authority to the medical and scientific community, but now the medical authorities were entrenched in public health and they had this painfully developed expertise and strategies for you know, ameliorating the public health. And those were to some extent threatened by this new theory. So the public health authorities actually really rejected uh, Snow's theories as well. There, at this time, there was no germ theory. So it was really unclear why the water was dangerous sometimes and not others. So I'm gonna go back to a slide I showed you earlier. Microscopes had allowed people to see little animals in the water for a while, but those things seemed to be there all the time. At one point, a water company taken to task for the state of their drinking water insisted that it was pure when the opposing faction said, well, when I turn my, my faucet on, live eels come out of the tap. They said, well, they're alive, right? So pretty healthy. <laughs> Microbes could be analogously explained. They were there, they were healthy, you're fine. The original discovery of the Vibrio cholerae, we now understand, uh, was made by Filippo Piccini in Florence in 1854. But again, the discovery didn't get any traction. And in part, one reason for that is that scientific knowledge circulated in Western Europe between the sort of major um, capitals, between uh, France, you know, Paris and France, between Edinburgh and Scotland, between uh, Germany and, and Britain. And 
medical knowledge coming out of Italy, coming out of Eastern Europe, that often got published locally and didn't really cross over. It didn't get the kind of respect. And so no one knew, or no one in Britain knew that this had in fact been discovered and it sort of died on the vine. Robert Koch was until recently credited with the discovery in 1883 in Egypt. And he of course did discover it. He just discovered it after Pacini. He and his team found a bacillus in the intestinal mucosa of people who died of cholera, but not of other diseases. And by this time, the West is a little more ready for a germ theory of disease. And the fact that cholera is basically controlled in the UK made it a more fully colonial problem that felt less threatening at home. And old schema die really hard. Despite the early work of John Snow, many still believe that cholera was caused by miasmata. Here we are. In an 1874 international conference, representatives of 21 governments voted unanimously that, quote, ambient air is the principal vehicle of the generative agent of cholera. In other words, they just, they said, well, it might be, yeah, it might be spread through water sometimes, but really it's mostly air. Like that's really the main way that it spread. Koch's findings began then to shift scientific knowledge, but still in Germany, they were divided. In France, they were almost entirely against Koch's theory and nearly so in England. In 1885, in an international sanitary conference that Robert Koch attended along with 28 other countries' representatives, the British delegation successfully blocked quote, any discussion on the etiology of cholera in part because Britain was anxious that its own imperial possessions, which were now understood to be the origin of cholera, were not blamed for several worldwide pandemics that had killed literally millions of people. The scientific method is imperfect and it's welded by imp wielded by imperfect humans. We don't know what we don't know. Uh, and as this shows, we're not really good at taking on new information. But it is the best way we have discovered to correct confirmation bias, to get to new knowledge that is counterintuitive, because it provides ways for us to get outside our own confirmation biases and collect information that then we don't know what to do with. And that enables us to get to new knowledge. Then you have to get others, lawmakers, leaders, the public, to understand and accept a novel challenge to beliefs and pre-existing knowledge. And to do that, you have to take into account how that new knowledge challenges sincerely held core beliefs and identities, how it will be politicized, often disingenuously by special interests. But we should also remember that people tend to sincerely believe in things that are also good for, say, their pocketbooks or their convenience. It's not all opportunistic, but we have to have a common ground. We have to have some trust in our knowledge workers for this to work. The growth of public health was a landmark shift in the history of humanity. It made the world a much better place. It saved millions of lives. Uh, it enabled you know, social mobility uh, for people who otherwise were born into circumstances where they almost certainly would have been you know, dead of disease fairly early, impossible to educate, et cetera. Um, and this was, this was a huge, huge accomplishment despite the fact that it took place in fits and starts. Would we be able to embrace a change as dramatic as that now? Uh, and why or why not? All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Um, any questions at this time? Okay, one moment, please, here in the Oak Room. Uh, thanks for that really interesting presentation. Um, in my experience uh, overseas, uh, uh, had some encounters with cholera, mm. particularly in dealing with refugee populations. Yeah. But what I wanted to point out was that you know, during the, the Ethiopia famine of 84, 85, the Marxist military government there was, did not want any mention of the word cholera. They knew it was there, but they just sort of made believe it was some other disease. And it was actually quite difficult for those who are working in public health and diplomacy to communicate about the issue as well as 
those working in refugee camps. Another instance is uh, uh, in Haiti, the UN peacekeepers supposedly brought cholera with them and it created sort of a, a, a political issue for the Haitians who were uh, condemning the United Nations for causing the problems there. And I think they even took the UN to court. But it's just fascinating the political issues that are um, still being uh, found when it comes to cholera. Absolutely. And, and part of that, I think, has to do, again, with the perception that it's a filth disease, that it, you know, in many places, and I would assume, I don't, I don't know the specific circumstances of the government you're talking about, but I would assume that people would think of it as a failure of government, a failure of the government to protect them. And so, you know, and the government doesn't want to, uh, you know, admit that responsibility. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, any kind of epidemic disease that is not, you know, endemic and seasonal and what we're used to tends to call forth these kinds of defensive reactions and tends to be politicized because short-term narratives get caught up in the other narratives that are hang happening at the same time. Thank you. Shirley, go ahead. Uh, thank you. This is very, very interesting. We have certainly seen how during our pandemic right now, uh, the lack of trust of government and science is really, really high. But mm -hmm. it seems to me the next big area for misinformation is going to be space exploration. That's mm -hmm. going to interfere with all of religious kind of concepts and the beginning of the Earth. And how do you see the possibility there happening? That's a really fascinating uh, question, and I actually haven't thought much about it. So I, I'll be interested to see to see what you all say about it. I mean, I, I have to say the thing that I think of as the sort of immediate, the immediate big scary thing that's challenging everybody's schema and that's being caught up in religious and political um, responses and pocketbook responses is climate change. Um, right. um, and of course, space exploration is sometimes offered as a kind of solution <laughs> to climate change, like we'll just go somewhere else. You know, the technology the seems so far away to me at this point that I think, you know, that's that's still at the at the level of fantasy. But what do you think? Well, there's so much going on in aerospace that we don't really know about with communication and viewing things and it just seems like the different political schemas can really, really send out a lot of misinformation that could scare everybody to death. Yes, yes. Um, I think there's there's certainly a lot of that around. Um, and it's also, um, it distracts from more immediate uh, problems right. and solutions and, that we need to find. <laughs> and who do you trust? Right. And, and right now, the U.S. is so polarized that people mm -hmm. don't really trust anyone and that the, the default response to anything that people don't like is, well, the other side is, is wow. corrupt. Right. Um, and, and we've seen that recently with the, the raid down south. Right. That the response is, well, the FBI are now are now corrupt. Right. 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 Um, and, you know, this was they were team FBI a little while ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So keep us informed of what we what we should think of that's real instead of just <laughs> misinformation. I, I wish I wish I had that kind of knowledge. I was going to say it sounds like you're the authority now, Dr. Gilbert. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Betty Kramer. Go ahead. I would like to know how an English teacher got interested in cholera. Right, that's a great question, and I anticipated someone would ask. I actually um, had thought about doing something with the literature, but the problem with that is that everybody, if everybody hasn't read the same thing, then it's really hard to discuss it in a way that's interesting or intelligible. So um, basically, I first got interested in this when I was writing my first book, which came out of my dissertation. And I was interested then in um, popular novels by women uh, in the 1860s. And you know, uh, this is before this is before you could Google everything. So I was just sort of painstakingly going through all of these uh, all of these magazines and reviews to see, well, you know, what were people saying about these books? And and I noticed over and over again the metaphor was disease, right? Like 
people are reading these books and it's, it's, it's causing them to be diseased. It's causing them to want more stimulation. It's like a drug. It's like an opiate. It's like an epidemic. And I thought, yeah. well, where is that coming from? Uh, and I started looking around and I was like, oh, you know, polar epidemic. Okay. Um, and I thought, well, that's, that's really interesting. I'm going to table that and go back to it with my next book. And that became my next three books, um, which really took me out of literature per se. And, you know, I started attending a lot of like historians conferences and I, in this area, I cross that line pretty regularly. Um, you know, a lot of people think of me as a historian of medicine in the period, although my training is not in history. So my, my remit is very narrow, much narrower than a trained historians would be. But um, I got interested in, first of all, the metaphors of disease and how they were floating around. And then I got interested in, well, you know, what were the rhetorical responses to disease? And that took me to reading sermons, reading, you know, discussions in parliament, reading articles, reading medical, you know, journalism and so on. And that took me to the maps. Uh, and I ended up doing a book on maps as really, it's the origin of medical data visualization that really takes off in this period um, and learning about how maps operate rhetorically. So again, not a, card not a cartographic historian's perspective at all, much more a textual perspective on uh, how maps are made, are, are understood and are made to signify. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, okay, I have one here in the Oak Room, one in a moment. You make me hustle back here. <laughs> I think those are great uh, glasses that you have on. Glasses, your glasses, yeah. Oh, <laughs> likes your glasses. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It took me a long time to find them. <laughs> um, I found this quite fascinating the distrust of science and knowledge has yeah. been going on for centuries. What can scientists do to become more trustworthy? Because we still see the same thing now. Right. Don't and trust I, science. I do think that there are some differences that we want to take into account. I mean, first of all, the scientific, the scientific method is really new at the beginning of the 18th century. So people are really divided about whether it has any value, um, you know, concerned about its challenges to faith and so on and so forth. We're in a different place with that now, right? Because we've had two centuries of the scientific method and we've seen like the technological results and so on. We've seen this incredible blossoming. Uh, and, you know, most people now without understanding statistical knowledge will refer to it. Well, you know, nine out of 10 people say this is true, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so there is more appreciation for the tools of scientific knowledge making, but at the same time, right from the beginning, Frankenstein, right? <laughs> there is also a distrust of the scientist who seems to be um, a little inhuman, whose methods uh, seem frightening, maybe seem close to um, older violations of religious law like magic in the Renaissance. Um, and you see that figure of the sort of mad scientist really throughout the 19th century, and it kind of peaks at the end of the 19th century, right? You've got like, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Island of Dr. Moreau, right? So there was a lot of fear of the scientist who was, who vivisected animals, right? Um, and, you know, again, the fear of the doctors who were stealing bodies so that they could, you know, they could do dissections. It's a perennial problem to um, kind of communicate with the broader public. And part of it is that there's Scientists have a problem, which is also an advantage, <laughs> sometimes an advantage. People don't understand what scientists do. And that's a problem because then people think they're doing all kinds of weird stuff, right? Whenever there's any kind of paranoia, that's where it goes. Like the scientists are like doing something in the lab and making, you know, bat diseases or whatever. Um, the flip side of that is that because people believe that they don't understand what scientists do, there's less attacking of the basic enterprise of science, right? People don't come along and say, we should abolish the physics department at UF. Nobody understands, except the, the people in the physics department, what they're doing over there. 
like I've tried to read that they're doing something with baryons they're pink I don't know but, but I also I know I don't understand what they do but I believe what they do is important and I think a lot of people approach it that way whereas there's a lot more interference with the humanities because the assumption is oh well we can all read we know what they do um so I think you're seeing a lot of distrust of academics and knowledge workers really across the board right now. Um, I know that this is a long rambling response. So what can scientists do specifically? I think, um, you know, better scientific communication with the general public, which is hard because there's only really so much that you can put across to people who don't have specialized knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, controlling the narrative, uh, you know, one thing that's happening because of social media and because of the attack on scientists is that more scientists are getting on Twitter and talking about their research and putting themselves out there. And that means there's also a lot of disinformation and there are some genuinely crazy people who do science too, but, but people have a sense more of a scientist as a real person who like owns a dog and works in the lab part-time and talks about their problems at work in a way that I think wasn't the case, say in the 1950s, when you had all the scary, you know, uh, movies about the mad scientists and their infinite resources. Yeah, um, that, that's one of the things I was going to suggest that perhaps the movies, the media should depict science as more believable and more trustworthy rather than Frankenstein and, and all that kind of stuff. Dr. Yeah. You've got heroic narratives like uh, Contagion, which was a really prescient movie um, and which they did in consultation with a lot of people at the CDC, which actually did show sort of heroic scientists. But it's hard because real science is a lot of like going into the lab and slogging away and, you know, sitting at a computer and it's not that exciting. Right. And and it's very doesn't... exciting. <laughs> it was. Yes, it's very exciting, very exciting, but not for a TV show. Right. Um, for TV shows, you want, you know, not the pediatrician who comes in every day and, you know, and, and sees patients for, for, for TV shows, you want St. Elsewhere, you want the emergency room. And so movies about scientists tend to take up those really high stakes situations because that's what brings viewers. Okay, thank you. Shirley, go ahead. Uh, I was going to answer some of that because a lot of the national funding organizations now kind of demand that the scientists have community uh, appreciation boards or involvement boards yeah. and they are trying very hard to educate the public in a different way than used to be and it's really being promoted by the funding agencies to yeah. involve the community. Yeah, this is this has been true for a while in the UK, where almost any grant proposal, and this is true in the humanities, true where they actually have money for the humanities in the UK in a way that we mostly don't here. Um, anything you propose has to also account for impact, and impact means some kind of like communication with the general public. There's a lot more of an audience for that there. A lot of sort of ordinary people will read history books and books about the popularized books about science. A lot of them, a lot more people will attend lectures really regularly. There's not as much of a culture of that here. Um, and where there is, it tends to be at universities or it tends to be in large cities. Um, but, you know, uh, I think that that's actually been helpful. And now what I'm seeing for the, because every once in a while I re review these grants, even though I'm, I'm not in the UK, all the younger academics are being told you have to write in you know, how you're gonna have a Twitter feed for this and, you know, how are you going to have a social media engagement aspect on this? So that someone who's doing a research project also has to have a museum exhibit, also has to have a Twitter feed, also has to have some public events, you know, that are, that are not just lectures to which the public can come, but probably won't. Well, we appreciate all the questions and and just everything that you've shared with us today, I appreciate your time. We will look forward to our next session next week and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs>